Well, good morning. Good morning. We, as you can tell from our series uh, little graphic here, we are going to be focusing the next few weeks on how to neighbor. I have been fortunate from the time I was a kid to have great neighbors around me in every place uh, that I have lived, whether that was in the Akron, Ohio area, or moving to Omaha, Nebraska, or then here to the few different houses that I've lived in the greater Phoenix area. I remember very clearly when we bought our first home in Omaha, we uh, really loved living where we lived on one side of us, where we kind of shared an entrance to a driveway with our neighbors over there. Walt and Phyllis lived there. They were an older retired, retired couple. Their son, who was a few years older than us, lived on the other side of us. So we had Dannenbergs on either side. And they were just great people. I remember when 9-11 happened, uh, they went to the Catholic Church just walking distance from our front door. And they came over and said, hey, would you guys like to join in prayer in our driveway? You're a priest, right? And I'm like, well, I'm not really a priest. I'm married. But yeah, I, I'm a religious guy. And she's like, well, why don't we do that? Because the president's calling for us to pray. And I said, great, we'll meet in my driveway at such and such a time on this day, and uh, we'll pray. They go, great, we'll bring the candles. And so they uh, <laughs> brought the candles, and we would light the candles, and we would all pray. And I had this, um, we did this for weeks until it got too cold to be outside. And uh, we had this kind of wax stain in our driveway that just represented, you know, a lot of our hearts coming together. It was great. Across the street were Karen and Robert, a younger couple, no kids, just newly married, uh, we got to know them really well, had a big snowstorm, power went out on their side of the street, but not on ours. They spent time with us. We shoveled driveways together, got to know each other. Uh, they split up, unfortunately. We lost track of them for a period of time, but then Karen reached out to us online. Uh, she is now a Jesus follower living in uh, the Northeast, uh, heard the story of our, our daughters, and has gotten involved in foster care and recently adopted a child, and so we are super um, Cool to stay connected with her in that way. Moving here to the Phoenix area, I lived in a couple of different places. Uh, we lived in Vistancia right when it was first built, and God really brought great neighbors around us. Randy and Julie down the street uh, just have been so uh, precious to us. And matter of fact, Julie joined our team, worked as our children's director for a while. And then Steve and Leah right next door, they're like family to us. Uh, we would just find ourselves in their home or they would be over with us. We still stay connected uh, with them even though we moved. We li now live in the central Phoenix area, uh, 43rd and northern area, um, closer to where Sydney goes to school and uh, closer for our other kids' uh, schools as well. And um, man, we love it there. We have a neighbor across the street who is from Puerto Rico. His English is about as good as my Spanish, so we get along great. And then uh, next door to us on the other side is a couple from... Iraq, the refugees that have been uh, placed here in Arizona, and uh, we love them. We are so close with them. They actually have uh, the garage code to our house, and so they can come over uh, whenever they want. We they had this big, we did some things with them, and they had this huge feast uh, for us. Uh, man, tons of Middle Eastern food. I don't know if you've ever had Middle Eastern food, but it's a different kind of a food, and I loved it. And they were like, here, keep eating more and more. You too skinny. You too skinny. And they... <laughs> kept force feeding me, you know, food after food, and it was great. So I've had the privilege of having lots of great neighbors, as I'm sure you have as well. And most of the time, our love and our concern for our neighbors will be returned. We've all learned the secret of having good neighbors, and that is to be a good neighbor ourselves. That if I'm a good neighbor to my neighbors, then they in turn reciprocate that most of the time. But even when they don't, Jesus tells us that we should be good neighbors to those that we run into. Matter of fact, he talks about this in Luke chapter 10. Words are on the screen. Luke chapter 10, 25 through 29. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he boldly said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, and with all of your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, right on, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But seeking to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? I find it interesting here and in other places that Jesus connects our eternal life with how we treat the people that are around us, our neighbors. It has been easy to love my neighbors over the years because they have been easy to love. Well, 
Most of them have been easy to love. Some of them that I didn't mention, not so much. Some of the ones that I didn't talk about were, well, they were a challenge. Have you had those neighbors? They're a challenge to love. Uh, Because neighbors like this come into our lives from time to time, we might not ask the question for the exact same reasons that this individual is, but we do ask the question, who is my neighbor that you really want me to love, Jesus? And please, can it not be some of them because they're really hard to love? Thankfully, throughout the scriptures, we have this answered for us, that not just here in this passage, but from cover to cover, we are told who our neighbors are. It's so, such a big deal to us that we've encapsulated it in a few of our values uh, here at Journey, just by way of refresher to remind you or to introduce some of you who are new uh, to Journey. We value passion for God. That's why we worship on Sunday and encourage you to grow in your relationship with Him. We want to passionately worship and serve God. We value people regardless of their past and, and people who are far from God. That's one thing that we value. We, we care about those who are distant from God. We don't look at them as, as uh, those people out there that we should avoid. We look at them as the way God looks at them, as people that he is passionately loving and caring about. Uh, we believe here strongly and we value personal relationships where we can be intentional with one another. That's why we have so many small groups. We think in the context of relationships with other people who are following after Jesus, your life is going to be transformed. Uh, We believe in practical love expressed to our city, our country, and our world. That's why we do things like the blood drive or the backpacks for kids who are in need or we do foster care or things like that. We uh, really want to show love practically. As Joel mentioned, uh, we, uh, are, we really value prayerful dependence upon God, upon his spirit. None of what we want to see accomplished in the world will happen on our own strength. We want God to flesh it out. And then finally, this value here, which is going to consume us for this series, we want to pursue justice for the POWs of our world. The poor, the orphan, the widow, and the stranger. These are our neighbors, the scripture tells us. Among other people, these are our neighbors, so they will be our focus. How do we neighbor the POWs? There's a great chasm between knowing and doing. I know a lot of stuff, and from time to time, I say after I do something, shoot, I knew I shouldn't have done it that way. I know better. So knowing and doing can often be far apart. But we're going to trust that God is going to bring knowing who our neighbor is and loving our neighbor closer together through this series. So let me just pray for us. Can you join with me? God, thank you uh, that Jesus gives us life and he gives us a purpose and he gives us a vision, a vision to be like him in the world. And thank you, God, not only for his tangible example and his life-changing words, but thank you, God, that you want to use him to empower us right now. And so I pray that you would do that as we look at this series, um, How to Neighbor. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, We're going to start at the end, uh, of the end of the POWs. We're going to start with the topic of how do you love or how do you neighbor a stranger? I know you were told when you were little, don't talk to strangers. You were told that? And you were told, never take candy from a stranger's except on Halloween night when you're to go out in the dark without your parents and take as much candy from strangers as possible. Sorry to tell you this, but you're not a kid anymore. Those rules don't apply to you. God wants you not only to talk to strangers, but to be Jesus in skin to your neighbors who are strangers. I suppose it'd be helpful for us to kind of get our minds around what I really mean when I say a stranger. A stranger is anyone who is not part of your tribe. You're a part of a tribe or probably a few different tribes, aren't you? Uh, In the Old Testament, in that period of history, there were a lot of tribes and people were tribal. They would intermarry with one another and only within their tribe. They would worship their God only that the God of their tribe Uh, They would do things and travel together as a tribe. And we think of that as back then, and we don't really consider ourselves as being parts of tribes, but you totally are. I reflected on mine. I'm part of a hunting tribe. 
There's a group of people that I speak a certain language with and we have certain things in common and when we talk, it's all around our hunting tribe stuff. I'm in a CrossFit tribe, I'm in a church tribe with you, I'm in a family tribe with them and we're all kind of part of this big American tribe, although not every American is part of each of our tribes. I am comfortable when I am close, in close proximity to my tribe. I speak the same language that my tribe speaks. I like the same things. I believe the same things. I laugh at the same jokes. Uh, my tribe gets me as your tribe gets you. As I spoke about that, you were probably thinking about what tribes you belong to. Maybe try to identify, if you haven't already, what types of tribes are you a part of? Then think through who isn't in your tribe. You know, those people over there that aren't part of your in group. They may vote differently than you. They may dress differently than you. They may look differently than you. They speak differently than you. They love differently than you. Shoot, they're just different than you are. That's, not why they're, that's why they're not a part of your tribe. I am suggesting that those who aren't in your tribe are the strangers in your life. So how do you neighbor the strangers in your world? How do you do that? Thankfully, the scripture tells us uh, how to neighbor these POWs in our land and those are around us. It, sure, we have to do a little work to dig at it and what does this really mean for us today? But broadly speaking, it lets us know how we are to be a good neighbor to the POWs and we're gonna focus on those broad categories. Jot this down. How do you neighbor a stranger? You do it with empathy. You do it with empathy. You realize the difference between empathy and sympathy, right? Sympathy is I feel bad for you that you're going through this or that. Empathy is I feel bad for you because you're going through something that I have been through myself. I've been in your shoes. I get where you are. I understand. I feel bad for you because I've been in that spot. As God was transforming a people into his people, as he's calling them out of Egypt, he said, listen, I want you to express empathy to the strangers that you meet along your journey. He says this in Exodus chapter 23. Check out the screen. Exodus chapter 23, verse 9. You shall not oppress a stranger, since you yourselves know the feeling of a stranger. For you also were strangers in the land of Egypt. They were slaves, the Jewish people, in Egypt for generations. There was nobody alive that was coming out of Egypt that knew anything but being a slave. They were always strangers. They were always foreigners. They were always outsiders. Think about it. Have you ever been to a place where you've been a stranger? Where you've been the outsider, the one that you felt like everybody was looking at you because you didn't belong Maybe you didn't think the same way, you didn't act the same way, you were just out of place. How did you feel? Put yourself in that scenario. I had a friend who used to go to Journey here a, a few years back, and he told me one time of, of uh, a party that he went to. He comes from a large um, uh, Mexican-American family, and he has a lot of extended cousins and aunts and uncles that he doesn't really know that live here in the Phoenix area. And he got invited to a birthday party for one of his cousins, I think it was. And he got his gift and he took his food and he went to the party, uh, got directions to the house, showed up, uh, found the party, lots of people there, walked inside, um, threw down his food with the rest of the food, got his plate all fixed, sat down, uh, began to eat uh, after he set down his present with all the other presents uh, for his distant co cousin, you know, and and just had a great time, was just having a great time. Didn't know a lot of people around him, uh, but knew that he was a part of their tribe, and so he felt good, you know, being there and enjoyed himself. Uh, but after about an hour or so, he decided to get up and kind of walk around and, and look for the people he did know, made his way outside, you know, enjoyed just being there. The place was hopping, nice and lively. And then he finally made it all the way back to where he started, and he realized something in the flash of a moment. I am at the wrong house. <laughs> he made it to the right street. It was the right ethnic group, but the house he was supposed to go to was a few doors down. Imagine the feeling that he had. 
first, when he was there, he was like, this is great. I'm having a great time. I love all this stuff. And then all of a sudden, he couldn't wait to get out of that party, right? That's what it's like to be a stranger. It feels weird. We get that. We feel like outsiders. And that feeling that we've had when we've been strangers in the past is the feeling that we should draw upon to have compassion for those in our lives who are strangers among us. So how do you neighbor? Empathy. How do you neighbor with strangers? I'm going to suggest advocacy. You stand up for them. Here's a little Bible trivia for you. Do you know the oldest book in the Bible is? I'll give you a hint. It's not Genesis. Sure, that covers some of the oldest events um, in the scripture, but the oldest written book is the book of Job. It was written before Moses. It was written before the law was given. It was written before God had Moses come up on the mountaintop, reveal himself through the Ten Commandments, pen him on stone. It was before the Levitical priest. It was before, uh, written before all of that stuff was written. Yet even though Job was written before the Jewish nation really took off, Job knew that the calling of a good person was to stand up and advocate for the stranger. Job chapter 29, verse 16. In Job chapter 29, verse 16, we read, I was a father to the needy. I took up the case of a stranger. He understood that being a God-fearing person being a good and righteous person meant standing up for the stranger that is among you. A few weeks ago, my family and I were driving to go to lunch. We're doing a little home remodel, and our kitchen's trashed right now. And so we decided we would go uh, to Payway and try to get some $5 orange chicken, <laughs> way better orange chicken. And so we headed towards Metro Center Mall which isn't too far from our house, to get our food for lunch. We took two cars because we were going two different directions after lunch. My wife was in front of me with some of the family. I had Mia uh, in the truck with me. We are driving uh, north of Northern on 35th Avenue, uh, past the burnt down Safeway and some apartment complexes that are around there. And as we got close to Dunlap, I noticed off to the apartment complex on the right, just off of the sidewalk and kind of in the entranceway, uh, that there was a scuffle beginning to take place. And so as I was driving in that far right lane, I looked a little bit closer at the scuffle and realized it was a rather um, imposing younger man who was six foot, six one or so. Uh, fighting with a smaller person who then I realized was a young lady. And as they were exchanging blows, something inside of me just took over. I slammed the truck's brakes on, put it in park, told Mia to stay put, got out of my truck and slammed the door on 35th Avenue and started running towards the altercation. The guy turned around and saw me and in a moment could tell from the look in my eyes that I am the father of three girls and that he is in trouble. And he split right away. It was either me and my intimidating physique. <laughs> I don't know why you're laughing here. I don't know. Or it was the other people that were joining with me and running towards the altercation. For the sake of this story, it definitely was me. <laughs> they thanked me. I got back in my truck, and I turned to Mia, and I said, it's never okay for a guy to hit a girl. <laughs> She's like, what did I do? <laughs> what did I do? Am I in trouble? And I kept preaching as I drove off <laughs> to my daughter all about how you just don't put up with that. Call me old-fashioned, but I just don't think that's right. Ever. Amen. Ever right. As we kind of got closer to payway and the adrenaline flushed out of my body, I began to have some thoughts. <laughs> and my rational self started to have a conversation somewhere inside of me with my hero self. Hero self, what was your plan back there? <laughs> what exactly did you think your 154-pound body was going to do in that moment. 
What if, my rational self said, he had a gun? I said, I have two. <laughs> my rational self said, what if he had a knife? Well, I'd get cut. <laughs> what if you actually caught up to him and you won and found yourself in jail? What then? It would be a good sermon illustration. <laughs> you see, there are always reasons not to stand up for the stranger, right? And some of them are good reasons. And some of them are rational. Some of them make sense. But they don't jive with what God calls us to do. It's easy to think about all the reasons why we shouldn't do something for a stranger why we shouldn't stand up for them, put ourselves out there and take a risk for them. To put it the way that Jesus does in the rest of this passage, as you go to read the Good Samaritan story, uh, you find a, a stranger that's been beaten and robbed and left uh, uh, beaten up on the side of a road. First guy comes, he's religious, he passes by the other side. Second guy comes, he's religious, passes by on the other side. Finally, the irreligious guy in the story uh, takes him up puts him on his donkey and takes him and pays for his expenses to get better. And uh, Jesus says, two out of three people won't help. The majority won't stand up or won't advocate or help out the stranger that's in need. May you never be in that majority. May you always be in the minority that advocates and stands up for the strangers among you. Not just when you see a damsel in distress, but when you're walking down the road and see somebody in need and you realize that you can indeed do something about it. Feeling for them is great, and that's important, but fighting for them is significantly better. This is challenging stuff. It makes us think about all these different types of scenarios and how would we respond? What's the right thing to do here or right thing to do there? How does it all work together? Well, the most challenging thing is coming next. Not only do we advocate, not only do we sympathize and empathize, but how do we neighbor? Jesus says we do it with hospitality. Feeling for and standing up for somebody is great. It's one thing. But inviting them into the intimacy of your life and into the intimacy of your home is quite another. Our home is where we walk around in our boxers. at least in our boxers. Please, Lord God, in our boxers, we walk around in our home. It's a safe place. It's where we unwind. It's where we disconnect. It's where we are ourselves without feeling the pressure of being something that somebody wants us to be. And these are good aspects about having a place we call home, whether it's an apartment or a house. But I suggest to you that God is wanting to repurpose our dwelling for so much more than just our personal benefit. He wants us to open our hearts and open our homes to the stranger, just like he did for us. He left his home to come here to invite us in. And he asks us to do the same thing for strangers that God did for the strangers that are us. Jesus says after this very long story in Matthew chapter 25 about judgment at the end, he rewards people and says, I was a stranger and you invited me in. <clears throat> sure, I'm willing to jump out of my truck to help a young lady in her distress and to help a young lad find his way in life, but invite them into my home? Is that something I'm willing to do? few months after moving into this building, uh, there was an individual that was around here, around the church, uh, hanging around the lobby from time to time. Tammy, you'll remember this. And uh, this individual uh, would come in, use the bathroom, and then go over to CVS. And, and, uh, but when service was around, I, I didn't really see him um, all that much. And then one day, I, I caught up to him after his service was over, asked him his story, uh, turns out he uh, had a drug issue, 
and he was homeless, and he was living behind uh, one of the buildings out here in the parking lot. And he had been living there for a couple weeks. And he would come in, eat a couple donuts, use the bathroom, and go on his way. He didn't want to bother us. And I said, well, would you like some help? We could probably help you if you're willing. He said, yeah, I think I'm at a spot where I would like some help. So I talked to my friend Tammy, who helps us um, uh, with this sort of thing here at, at Journey and helps us move in that direction. And she gave some great counsel and advice. And I uh, said, hey, man, let me have all your clothes. Uh, I'll give them my wife, Christy. She'll take them home, and she can wash them all up for you. And then I'll take you to lunch. And then afterwards, I'm sure we'll figure something out, and we'll get to, you to a shelter that can get you some help. Uh, he agreed. So I gave um, his very dirty clothes to my wife, said, take this home. Please wash it. I will uh, come after lunch, so make it a priority. And then I took him down to uh, Cane's because everybody likes Cane's. So we went down uh, to Cane's and had a big lunch, um, enjoyed our time together. And, and then I made my way to the house. Uh, Chrissy had done the clothes, had them all folded nicely. And um, I uh, ran inside. I said, hey, wait here. Ran inside, grabbed all, my, all his clothes, came back out. He packed them back in his little backpack. And I took him down to the shelter that Tammy directed me to so that he could get some help. And at first, I was feeling pretty good about it, you know? My well, that seems like the right thing to do. But upon further reflection, I'm not so sure. Honestly, I think I shortchanged the guy. I think I should have invited him in over to my house for lunch, not taking him out to eat. Not that out to eat's a bad thing, but I think I took him out to eat because it was easier, because it was safer. Maybe I should have asked if he wanted to stay at my house that night. Challenging for sure. But the more I thought about it and the more I look at my heart, I realized that I was loving in an easy way, not in a way where I would see this stranger as my neighbor. Would I treat my neighbor the way that I treated him? I'm not so sure. He deserved better. He was my neighbor even though he didn't look or smell like it. And honestly, I think I let him down. I know, I, I know, this stuff's challenging. And I know through your head is going the same conversations that have been going through my head as I'm thinking about this. Where's the line? What do you do here? What's wise? And I get all of that stuff. I get it all. I do realize what I'm saying. There's always a reason, though, how do I put this? There's always a reason not to do it. But there is one reason, I think, that trumps them all. You, you saw me as a stranger, and you invited me in. That seems to trump them all. Take a look at the screen. Let me ask you this question. Is this your neighbor. You can go home today, pull up Google Earth, look something like this, get about a square mile around your house, take a screenshot of it, and then honestly ask yourself, do you love your neighbors who are strangers living in those homes? Are you neighborly to these people? Do you feel for them? Do you stand up for them? Do you invite them into your home. Or how about this picture? I know, I know. Life's too short not to sit in front of your computer all day posting negative things about the other party's political views. I get it. And I know you're changing lots of lives doing it. I mean, people all around you are all coming to your side. I get it. I understand. But are you neighborly to these people? that don't agree with you, that see it differently? Do you feel for them? Do you stand up for them? Do you invite them in? Or how about these strangers? Sure, they love differently than you, and, but are these strangers your neighbors? Are you neighborly? to these people? 
Do you feel for them? Do you stand up for them? Do you invite them into your home? Or how about people that look like this? Would these strangers ever be at your dinner table? Or how about these people? Are you neighborly to these people? Do you feel for them? Do you advocate for them? Will you invite them into your home? The one reason to feel for and stand up for and welcome these and any other stranger that God brings into your path is clear. Because how we treat the people that were pictured there is how we will treat this person pictured here. Now, I know that's not exactly Jesus. He's Jesus on a TV show. We don't really know what he looks like. Most of the time, we think of a guy that looks like this. I guess that's why they call him Jesus on the TV show. But the truth is there. For what we do to the stranger is what we are doing to him. And I, and I'm sure you as well, want to get there that day when I finally do get to see what he looks like and say, yeah, I saw you out there and I wanted to welcome you in. May God make us a part of that minority that sees somebody a stranger, and we feel for them, and we advocate for them, and we invite them in. May he make that so in our lives. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you that you saw us as strangers, and you came running towards us, and you did the ugly work, the messy work of inviting us into your, into your home, into your Father's house, and God, may we live in that way as well for your glory for our good, and for the good of the strangers around us. May they become our neighbors so we would love them as we love you, as we love ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen.